Hello, my name is Nathalie Trouveroy. I'm an art historian based in Belgium. Um, I have lived in India, I have lived in China, among other places. And some time ago, I wrote an essay for the India International Center called Landscape of the Soul. Now, this essay has been picked up for your English study books. And I'd like to explain a little bit uh, what that essay is all about. And here I'd like to give special thanks to a wonderful teacher in Kerala I've been in touch with. Uh, his name is Mr. Santosh Khanna. He's a wonderful teacher. He, if, if you are one of his students, I think you're very lucky. And I'd like to thank him very much for giving me the opportunity of explaining this essay to you. Now, in my essay, I mention the name and the story of a wonderful Flemish painter who lived in Antwerp in the early 16th century. His name was Quentin Metzeis. And I encourage you to look him up on the net and perhaps to find a very famous painting by him, of which I'll show you a photograph here. It's called The Money Lender and His Wife. The painting is in Paris at the Louvre Museum. Now, what do you see in here? You see not royalty, you see not a prince, you see a couple of people in their shop. They're money lenders and they're surrounded with the objects of their trade and objects that they have around them. Now, what is really important and nothing short of revolutionary actually for the time this painting was done in 1514 is that normally paintings like that were reserved for either the church or for royalty. Now here the fact that you are shown people in their daily life, people in a city, in a small shop, surrounded by objects that may be very beautiful and they are very beautifully painted, but they are not gold and they are not prestigious objects. They are objects of daily life and they are given the same dignity and the same attention as the painter would have given a prince or an, a bishop or an, an important person in, in, um, in the clergy. Now, that attention to objects of real life is very important in Western painting because that impulse of showing reality went on in landscape also. And in this essay, we are talking about landscape specifically. Now, let's go forward a few centuries and look at a few paintings by a wonderful French painter called Claude Monet. Now here is a lady in the garden at Saint Adresse. Another painting is a pond, a pond at a place called Mougeron. And he's also done a very famous series of paintings showing the cathedral church of the city of Rouen in France. Now, this is the cathedral in the evening, and you can see that the sun is setting and that the bottom of the cathedral is already in the shadow. And he came back at noon to paint this. Now, this painting, these cathedral images, are not like photographs. They're not very, very realistic, but they're still very site-specific. It is the cathedral. It is the main facade of the cathedral, not the side. It is specific for the season. It is specific to a specific time of day. So this is what I mean in the text when I say that the painter wants you to borrow his eyes, so to speak. 
he invites you to sit where he sat to make his painting and to look at a place really very much from his own point of view. And the title of a Western landscape painting, very often if you look at the titles, it will give you a place, a season, or perhaps even a time of day, evening, morning, noon. Now, this is what we are going to contrast the Chinese kind of landscape with. The essay begins with an anecdote, a little story. Uh, the Chinese love little stories to explain important concepts. They believe very much in the power of understanding a story instead of explaining something very abstractly and philosophically. The um, anecdote is about a very famous painter called Wu Daozi. Um, remember the name Daozi has a specific meaning. Daozi means son of the Dao or master of the Dao. Daozi can mean both. And Wu Daozi was a real painter but nothing of his work survives. He worked in the early 8th century and he was commissioned by the emperor to paint a landscape on the palace wall. And you've read the story, I hope. Uh, so the idea is that he invites the emperor to walk into the landscape and at one point a cave opens in the landscape. The painter goes in disappears, the gate closes, the cave closes, and the emperor is left outside with an empty wall because the painting has disappeared. Now what to make of that? What to make of that is that a landscape in the Chinese tradition is not a specific place. It's a place of the mind. Now if the West painter invites you to borrow his eyes, so to speak. The Chinese painter will invite you to get into his mind. Now, you may have uh, wondered why I'm doing this video with this calligraphy behind me. Now, um, this little piece of work has a lovely personal story. It is very simple. It was painted, uh, it was written. It's, the distinction is very, very uh, subtle in, um, in Chinese art. So it was written by my Chinese calligraphy teacher after a long discussion we had on the concept of landscape. And what it is, it's actually the word landscape. Now the word landscape in Chinese is shan shui. Shan means mountain, that's what you have here. Shui means water, that's what you have there. Now, um, in this calligraphy, my teacher has made an interpretation of the actual characters for Shan and for Shui, for mountain and water. This is a character for mountain. Uh, it's one, of, one example of a Chinese character as what we call a pictograph. It's a character that represents the actual thing that the word alludes to. And you can compare the character with the interpretation that my teacher made of it. So the character for mountain has a vertical line, two vertical lines on the side, and a baseline. Now here, in order to make the character a little more visual, the painter has turned that central line into a double line to make it more like the peak of a mountain. Now, the second character is the word shui. The idea, it's a little less pictorial, it's a little less visual, but this is the flow of water in the center and the eddies and the little waves that you have on the sides when a river flows through the landscape. Now, 
The interpretation went a little further in this case. This line is actually this little part of the landscape. This hooked line here is represented there, and the two lines on the side are represented as a long flowing line that ends up showing this word, Shan Shui, as an actual image of a mountain with a river flowing down from it. The, um, the lovely little touch about it is that he's written a dedication to me on top of it and he's turned it into a sort of cloud hovering over the mountain. Now, uh, as a little aside, I would like to tell you that this is a very typical, um, a very typical thing in the relation of teacher to student in China. It's a very important relation, and it's part of the relations that actually regulate the whole of society. You have the relation, uh, Con Confucius actually um, theorized the five relations in human society as the relation of subject to emperor, younger brother to elder brother, son to father, wife to husband, and importantly, friend to friend. But what's really important also is the relation of student to teacher, which is a little bit like the Indian relation of a student to his or her guru. You, you see the teacher not just as somebody who will give you information, it's somebody who is going to teach you how to live and how to understand your place in life, both in society and both in the general picture of the world. And this is where we come back to the essay and the ideas of the essay in Landscape of the Now, what does, this is what the word landscape looks like. Um, why is it, lands, why, why is the word landscape, mountain and water? Because it's not just, a landscape in the West can be just trees. You don't need a mountain, you don't need necessarily to have water in it. But in China it's important because it's a representation of a general idea of the universe as a balance between different energies and different forces, the yang and the yin. The yang is everything that is masculine, vertical, hard, hot, dry. The yin is everything that is feminine, yielding, horizontal, moist, cool, and one cannot exist without the other. The two have to be balanced. Now, the, sorry, I'm getting this. This is represented in, in, in a diagram that you certainly have seen. It's called the Taiji. The Taiji is the image of the balance of the yin and the yang. So the yin is rising, it's white, it's bright, it's turning around the yin, which is dark, going down, and each one contains the seed of the other. And they're wrapped around one another, they're completely complementary to one another. One cannot exist without the other. And the proper balance between the two is what is called the Tao. The Tao means the way. The way very much in which we understand it in the West also. The way as a manner of doing things, a rule, a method for doing things, but also a path that you have to follow. Not just in your walk from one place to another, but also the path that you have to follow in life. Now, what does a Chinese landscape look like? Remember the Monet, right? Now, this is a landscape painted by 
another famous painter called Ma Yuan. Now, you have a little path with little people in it. You have mist with water in between and you have the mountains. What is perhaps a little more difficult for you to see, I'll try to get a little closer, is that in the mountain you have a little remote temple here. Now, if you look at the general balance of this painting, you have the yin at the bottom of the painting, a darker place, it's very full, and uh, at the opposite corner, you have emptiness, you have brightness, and you have the mountain. Now, the painting has a lovely title. It's called Singing on the Road. And at the bottom corner, you have little people, indeed, singing on the road. If you look at the whole painting, they're almost invisible. You could easily miss them. But, as the French writer of Chinese origin, François Cheng says, he's a very well-known sinologist, and his expression to describe the little people in the landscape is that they are the eye of the landscape, the little thing that brings the landscape to life, and that brings you in touch with what's happening in that landscape. Now, um, if the Western painter wants you to borrow his eyes, the Chinese landscape painter wants you to enter his mind, enter his mood, and he invites you to, um, to follow that human path here you have human activity. The temple in the center. Now, remember what I said when I told you that the Western painter wants you to borrow his eyes, so to speak. Now, uh, the landscape painter in China wants you to enter his mind, but he also invites you to a spiritual path within the painting. Now, to come back to Ma Yuan's landscape painting, you have here the people in a sphere of human activity. Now, if they progress along the path in the mountain, they will cross the water, which is hidden by the mist here, and they will progress towards a little temple that is hidden here, and that is midway between the human activity and the freedom of the empty space, of the highest mountain in the sky. And so, it's really a spiritual landscape that you're invited to travel in. And we've spoken about the yin and the yang. So the yin is downstairs, okay, the, the lower part of the painting. It is dark, it is very full, perhaps a bit cluttered. And the top is bright, empty, shoots into the sky, it's vertical, and the very important concept that is often overlooked when you talk about the balance of the yin and the yang, when, when in, in that sort of dance between the yin and the yang that we've seen into the Taiji diagram, um, there, is, there is a turning point, there's a point where things revert to the other part, to the other aspect of the forces of the universe. Now, that point where things go from one aspect to the other is called the middle void. The way to explain that, it's a concept that is not very much um, emphasized. People usually just stick to yin and yang. But if you think of breathing, and you breathe in, there's a little pause, and then you breathe out. Breathe in and out, it's the yin and the yang, but there's that little suspension point that is the middle void. And this is what we have here also in the painting. And so the whole that big 
painting, that landscape, is not just a physical landscape. It's not a place. It's a place in the mind, but it's also a process. It's an invitation to walk on the way, the Tao, from human activity to a higher plane. A little bit like in the traditional um, Indian way of looking at the different stages in life, where you have first a stage where you are learning with your guru, and then you become a householder, and you take your rightful place in human activity, and you become productive, and you contribute to society, and then you step back, and um, you renounce your activities. You give it on to your children, and, um, and you step back and you become a little more meditative. In, in a later stage, stage in your life. And that is very much what this landscape also invites you to do. So, the Chinese landscape is not just a landscape of the mind, which is, so the first level is the calligraphy, the word, the literal meaning. A second level is the mental picture of the universe and the landscape. And the third meaning, the third level of meaning, is more spiritual. It's an invitation for you to enter the landscape, to enter that balance between the mountain and the water, the yang and the yin, and to internalize it and turn it into a landscape of the soul. Hence the title of my essay. And I'd like to finish this explanation by going back to that little anecdote we had in the beginning. Now, the story of the painter going to his own landscape, the landscape opening up for him and then vanishing behind him, and the emperor left outside, not being able to go in, is actually a very subtle criticism of the emperor as too wrapped up into the mundane preoccupations of ruling the empire and not being spiritual enough to understand that ruling the empire is actually um, all about preserving the balance of the universe and of human society. So there's a lot more to that story than actually meets the eye at very first side. Now I do hope that this little video was helpful. I hope that you enjoyed it and I'm taking this chance to wish all of you um, a very happy and successful path in your studies first but also in your life. Thank you very much for listening to me. Bye.